Hey, what's up everyone? Today we're going to be doing the laboratory section of the 2024 U.S. NCO local exam. So this is from questions 7 through 12. Let's start with question 7. Which apparatus would be most suitable for collecting a sample of solid barium sulfate produced through the reaction of aqueous solutions of barium hydroxide and sulfuric acid? So we're clearly doing some sort of precipitation reaction, so we need something that is able to collect our solid. A barometer is not appropriate. That's for measuring the pressure of a gas. And a beaker and a buree are both for solutions, so aqueous, um, aqueous substances. A Buchner funnel, Buchner. Buchner funnel. It looks something like this. And what it does is it has little pores uh, over here, and that prevents solids from going through. So you could do your reaction here, let the solids sit here, uh, while everything else kind of filters away. So Buchner funnel would be appropriate for a precipitation reaction, which is what we're trying to do here. Let's move on to question eight. A solution is prepared by dissolving 10 grams of a salt in 90 grams of water. What additional information is needed to calculate the molarity of this solution? Uh, one, the molar mass, and two, the density of the solution. Personally, I'm not a big fan of this question, and I'll show you why. So molarity, as you know, is just moles over volume. So we need some way to figure out the number of moles of the salt and we need to find out a way to get the total volume of the solution. The moles are, is pretty simple where we know that we have 10 grams of the salt. So we are going to need the molar mass of our salt, uh, which is one. So one is definitely required. And the volume is where it gets a little tricky. You know that you are dissolving this in 90 grams of water. And so when something usually dissolves, uh, in water, the volume of the solution doesn't change much. And you know the, the density of water. You know that it's about one gram per milliliter. So you could say that you have 90 mils and it stays at 90 mils for the entire solution. That would be applicable for any laboratory uh, environment. But if you wanted to be really precise, you would need to know the density of the solution because adding that 10 grams of salt could uh, change the volume of your solution, solution just a tad bit. So technically you would need two, but in a laboratory setting, you usually wouldn't care because the difference in volume would be negligible. Regardless, the question wants you to have both. And so the answer is answer choice C. Let's move on to number nine, which substance dissolves to give a colorless solution. So this is where you would uh, usually need to know your uh, colors of aqueous solutions. But this question is a little more simple. In order to have a colored solution, you would need some sort of transition metal uh, somewhere in your solution. So you can see that most of the answer choices have some sort of transition metal. This has chromium, this has manganese, this has iron, but A doesn't have any transition metals. So it's impossible for A to be colored. Therefore, you could kind of, without knowing any of these, you could uh, immediately say that your answer is answer choice A. Let's move on to question 10. Which substance does not give off heat when added to water? So uh, if you've done experiments, you would know that your two major culprits are going to be sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. These are very well known uh, exothermic reactions. They release a lot of heat and calcium oxide, you may know that too, is also very exothermic. Uh, KMNO3 is endothermic. Um, but if you didn't know that from an experimental standpoint and you were kind of shooting in the dark, Here's a little trick. So if something, if a compound is bonded very ionically, very strongly, such as uh, sodium hydroxide, that is very, very likely to be exothermic. However, if something is more weakly ionically bonded, like KMNO3, or sorry, KNO3, where your ion is really big, so the, uh, the uh, uh, ionic bond isn't as strong, then that is more likely to be endothermic. So that's a little trick to prevent you from being completely clueless if you, if you don't know immediately, but you should be familiar with some of these reactions and know that you know some of them are very exothermic. Um, I hope that you know that this is very exothermic and you should be careful in your lab if you're, if you're ever dealing with that. Let's move on to question 11. A solution of a nitrate salt does not form a precipitate when treated with dilute uh, sulfuric acid, which cation is not present in the solution. So we're told that we don't form a precipitate. So if we want to find out which cation is not present, we have to find out which one of these cations would produce a precipitate, which one would be insoluble. 
So our major compounds here are going to be our nitrate, so NO3 minus, and it's going to be our sulfuric acid. So the ion we care about there is the SO4 2 minus ion. So let's look at our solubility rules for these. Um, by the way, this chart is, um, I, I made this chart uh, with a lot of the exceptions that come up on the USNCO. I'll leave a link um, in the description if you want to download it, but this should be very helpful for you if you're dealing with uh, solubility rules. So let's go back to solubility for nitrate. Nitrate is always soluble, so we don't really have to worry about that. And then we have sulfate, which is always soluble unless it's barium, lead, calcium, or strontium. So we have to find one of these uh, ions in our answer choices, um, which is going to be answer choice D. So if you had lead in this solution, um, if you had lead in the solution, it would react with the sulfate and it would create something insoluble. It would form a precipitate. Therefore, our answer is answer choice D. Let's do the last question, question 12. Which measurement would be least able to distinguish between a sample of elemental bromine prepared using exclusively the bromine 79 isotope and one uh, prepared using exclusively the bromine 81 isotope? The answer choice you can get rid of right away is going to be mass spectrometry. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that word right, but mass spectrometry is the primary way of how you find what type of isotopes may be in some sort of sample. You can also uh, distinguish between isotypes using liquid density or vapor density. So if you know the density of liquid uh, of your uh, sample, let's say it's S or uh, let's call it rho for density, rho of your liquid, you know that that's going to come from the density of the 79 bromine plus the density of the 81 bromine at some sort of uh, weighted average. So some sort of constant and you know that A plus B is going to equal 1. So you could use this relationship to determine the uh, how much is the 79 bromine and how much is the 81 bromine. So with liquid density, you can find out uh, the isotopes in your uh, solution or your sample. And with vapor density, you could do the exact same process and also get an answer. What's left is infrared spectroscopy. Now, infrared spe spectroscopy is used for um, determining what, but bond, what bonds or functional groups may be in a compound. It's very common in organic chemistry. And this will tell you the bonds, but it won't tell you the isotopes since these are going to be bonded the same way regardless. That was the lab section. I hope uh, that was helpful. I hope you were able to learn something. Um, please leave a like and consider subscribing if uh, this was helpful. And I'll see y'all later. Peace out.